I never expected to be in a rock and roll band at all. I was a folk singer, you know, and then mm -hmm. all of a sudden the Beatles happened and mm -hmm. then everybody wanted, you know, you know, everybody was playing folk music around San Francisco, Paul Cantner and, and Jerry Garcia, we, we all plugged in and, and um, so I ended up in this band called Quicksilver Messenger Service and in San Francisco, it was like there was Quicksilver Messenger Service, The Grateful Dead, the Jefferson Airplane, Big Brother and Holding Company, and the bands were like, all of a sudden, it was like you're royalty or something like that. And I mean, I'm mean, just walking down in the Haight Ashbury sometimes. It, it, it was just, it was, it all, it, you know, because I was, you know, I, I mean, couldn't get anybody to come see me as a folk singer at all. All of a sudden, I'm walking down the street, and that something like a big deal. And I didn't feel any different, really, but it was really weird. But the most monumental thing was, before we even had a record contract, Quicksilver was signed to do Monterey Pop along with I mean that was that was probably the best music festival that ever was really I mean you know with Jimi Hendrix's you know burning the guitar and the, and the Who and Ravi Shankar and we I got, I got to stand on stage with my with my elbow on Duck Dunn's bass amp while Otis Redding's playing and I mean it was just like Whoa, you know? When I was a kid, I played classical violin, viola, and symphonies, and string quartets and stuff. And when I got out of college, I was, there was one, I don't know, the Kingston Trio and all the, the folk music was starting up again. So I bought a guitar when I was 20, 21, 22, something like that, and started. So that was about 1961, too. So. It, it ran into the beat, you know, the whole thing. I was a professional folk singer, which is an oxymoron, I think. <laughs> but, you know, I, I, enough so that I could quit my day job and then right. actually, you know, eat. <laughs> so. The Beatles. Yeah. <laughs> the Rolling Stones. I mean, I, I don't know. I mean that's who got us all got, got us all into it. I mean as soon as as soon as we all us folk singers saw saw a uh, hard day's night or help man, and then we were well that's what we should that's right. kind of what we're doing only we don't plug in well we can plug in can't we you know but it's for inspiration I mean I don't know I was inspired by everybody I mean I, I mean I, being inspired was was kind of what it was like being a Monterey pop I mean all of a sudden oh it's so just ready oh my god. You know, Jimi Hendrix, insane that the guitar was just part of him. It was, it was like it was alive. Right. Writing songs, I always liked writing songs with members of the band. I mean, we just get together and jam and make up words and stuff in, in Quicksilver anyway to start with, and then it got. It got kind of strange after a while. Drugs were involved. I mean, <laughs> I mean, one of the players just got got into to speed too much, and I mean, and, and got very paranoid and thought everybody was inferior because we weren't playing as fast as he was, <laughs> or living as fast, or talking as fast. But and anyway, so he he left, but he ended up coming back. So I mean, it was, it was it's all kind of strange. But like the first. The first Quicksilver album. I mean, I mean, I I wrote words for lyrics for two of them. And the lyrics usually aren't what I what I wrote, but there's one a song called "The Fool" that takes the whole second side of the first Quicksilver Silver album, and it just has this this little poem that I wrote after taking an acid, taking acid that that I uh, I mean I woke up in the morning and, and the typewriter was there and I had typed this thing in there. It says, Can you hear it in the morning? Sings the golden sun. Life's song is moving ever onward from and to the sound of one. Swirling in, swirling out, spirals high, never dies. And I mean I don't and it was it's, it's almost a religious thing, you know, and it, and it, we had this whole long thing that this was an instrumental and went through all kinds of different changes and all of a sudden, boom, there was this little song in the middle of it and then it ended in another instrumental. It, it, oh, it took 13 minutes to <laughs> get it out. 
And I wrote a love song to, to, my, to my wife at that point. And, and you know, I guess there'd be albums, album cuts, you know. Mm -hmm. and, until I wrote Jane, probably. I, I was figuring out this part on a piano and I was in charge of the session. Marty walked up and he said, that's nice changes, what do you, he says. He said, he says, well, yeah, I'm, I'm working on it. I'm thinking, I'm, it's going to be a song for you to sing if you, if you want. And he said, oh, okay, that'd be great, you know. And I had the idea, it was about a girl who was playing games, you know, taking on, you know, a girl that I was having problems with. <laughs> I, I was talking to Marty and I said, you know, I think I have to change this because I, I can't, I, I don't want I don't everybody to know who, who this is, you know. And he says, well, you, of course, you should change, protect the innocent, change your name Jane Doe. And I said, oh, okay. So Jane, anyway, he and I were, were working on this for, I don't know, a few months, you know, working out all the lyrics so they all work, worked out and, and, and it all made sense. It was in 1978 and Marty and Grace both quit the band. And so I, I, I played my idea of how it was going to go for Craig for Ch Chiquiso. And I said, but I kind of like it to rock rather than, than how, I, how I had it figured out because I had, was writing it for Marty, but I can see it's, it's, it really should rock rather than be like a period of the Rolling Stones thing where they were doing like Ruby Tuesday and things like that. But they were kind of were kind of Baroque classical changes, you know. I think they were kind of trying to imitate the Beatles. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> In a way. But anyway, and so Craig, he came out with this great rock arrangement. So. So he wrote the he wrote the arrangement, but I mean, you know, but the song was still the words and the and, and the changes and the, and the melody were, were all done. You know, so and Paul had had the intro going. So it's a it's, you know it's a, it's a band thing. Yeah, it's kind of to be happy. I don't know, playing in a band sometimes you know wasn't fun. Because I, I like when the, everybody's involved in, in, in every face of the music. When, when, when it changed to Starship and Paul left because it was too, it, you know, the, he didn't want to do that. And I didn't feel like I was good at that. And, and, and everybody agreed, so that's you know, so I left. And because and, it wasn't fun for me. And I don't know whether it was fun for them or not because it, it turned out that, I mean, uh, Starship didn't write any of their own songs, which was not bad, because they were great songs. <laughs> I love to sing them now. So. <laughs> I, I think I'm doing what I want to do now, but kind of like the first time. It feels like this is the band I always wanted to be in. I mean, if you really want to do something and you have some talent for it, Never give up. <laughs> I mean, I, that's that's it. I mean, you got to stick to it.